All right. So, um, uh, so again, today I'm going to talk about stratification and probably proportional to size sampling. Um, let's just get into it. We're going to start with some bad math. So I was tempted to take out the word NASA here, but hey, it's they own it. So uh, this is a mistake, some, some mistakes they made. So again, I like to, for those of you that are new or weren't here in the first week when I talked about this, I like to start every presentation with just an example of bad math to show everyone that you know, mistakes are made and everyone's human. And we can also sort of learn a bit from uh, the mistakes that they made. I find it easier to learn from mistakes that people make than to learn from the successes because nowadays successes and statistics are really theoretical and high level. And um, I would say less enjoyable to learn about than people's mistakes. Okay, so um, from 2001 to 2004, NASA did a survey of pilots. So everybody, I think everyone thinks of NASA, they think about space, but the first A in, in NASA is aeronautical. And so it has to do with everything that has to do with flying in the United States. NASA's sort of got a little bit of uh, their fingers in the pie. So they did this survey. They interviewed 30,000 pilots. So it was a fairly big project and it cost them $11 million to conduct. So, so it was no small project, no small feat. And they did this, this was in the early 2000s. It's getting a little bit dated, but it's still a good example of uh, when surveys can go wrong. So they uh, produced their results in 2007. They released 16,000 pages of raw survey results and they did it in PDF. And when I say they didn't do any kind of analysis, I mean, they didn't uh, publish any of the analysis they did. They were legally required by the funding for this to release the results in 2007. And so they picked December 31st because it's an incredibly slow news day. And in fact, I read the transcripts of they had a press conference over a uh, telephone and uh, they were accused of picking the slowest day of the news year to produce this because it had gone so poorly for them. So imagine if someone gave you survey results and it was 16,000 pages of data and they give it to you in PDF. Eventually they <clears throat> backed down and they released it in formats that could be used in SAS and Excel and other sort of databases. But originally they basically sent people photos of the data um, some interesting results. Um, it approximated four times the number of engine failures that were recorded with the FAA. So that's the Federal Aeronautical Association, some sort of, it's whatever the air people are in the United States. Um, they estimated the number, the total number of diversionary landings was impossibly high. And overall, the data was pretty much meaningless. So uh, they made a lot of mistakes. I'm going to come back and talk about uh, point number one and point number two in a minute. Um, on the plus side, uh, from what I could read from all this stuff, no one got hurt conducting the survey. Uh, it was maybe one of the bigger highlights of this. Now, this is, this is what I really enjoyed. Uh, NASA got a new um, executive director, whatever the title is of NASA, and they claimed that what the survey was to do was to explore, to explore survey methodology. So every mistake they made was made in a, in a way so they could learn what could work and what wouldn't work. Um, now, I mean, most of the stuff that they, most of the mistakes they made were already well known, uh, but it was still a nice little twist on their part. Everything they did, so this is early adoption of um, administrative data. They didn't ask a single question in their survey that wasn't already measured somewhere else. So they could have compiled all of this data from administrative records and got it 100% correct. Now, administrative data, I guess I should say, isn't perfect, but when you're collecting administrative data, there's sort of a hope that you're going to get that uh, better than uh, than in a survey. So, for example, if you're asked the pilots, you know, how long the flight took, they might round it to the nearest 15 minutes. Whereas, uh, if you're using administrative records from airports, they would have it, I assume, to the nearest minute. So, let's go back and talk about this. So, they approximated four times the number of engine failures that recur with the FAA. So, this is super bad news, and. One of the things I found out in reading the documentation on this thing was they treated each interview as if it was an independent event. So what they ignored was they ignored clustering. So what they would do is, is they would see a flight crew coming off a large plane. I don't know how big the, the largest flight crews are in international travel, but I, I know there's at least three or four, maybe even more uh, people in the cabin sometimes in the cockpit. And so they would treat each of those interviews like an independent event. So if a plane had an engine failure and the pilot, co-pilot, navigator, I'm not sure how many people are there, let's say three just to make my life easy, 
if the three people all came off and they all said, yes, we suffered an engine failure, the survey recorded this as there was three engine failures that day, even though there was only one. So they were sort of confounding this, this problem with clustering that they weren't taking into account. We talked in the first week, so two presentations ago, we talked about um, conceptual definitions. Here's an interesting thing where NASA was trying to, for the diversionary landings, NASA was trying to ask one question, but they were accidentally asking another. And so I usually put this to a, the class to, to see if they want to guess at what the definition of diversionary landing is, because most people get this one wrong. Um, when in laid person thought, like I would think, diversionary landing, I would think, is when you land at a different airport. But a diversionary landing is when you land at a different airport or if you land out of sequence. So if there's a, you know, a major international airport and there's four planes waiting to land and you have an emergency on your plane and you need to land uh, out of sequence, um, a pilot will consider this a diversionary landing. And so what NASA, I think what, what they were trying to record is the number of landings at airports other than those you were supposed to land at but they used the term diversionary landing, which made the pilots think, did I land at an airport I wasn't supposed to or wasn't planning on, or did I land out of sequence? And so they got the number of these things wrong. The, the conceptual definition, the words they were using weren't trying to capture what they were trying to get. So um, yeah, this survey didn't go very well. Uh, and again, them spinning this as a way to explore survey methodology, I absolutely love as a way to try to save this, but um, yeah, it, it was basically a waste of $11 million. All right, let's go into this. Let's, so there's two topics today. This could be two presentations, but you know I have an hour, so we're gonna make this one. So I'm gonna talk about stratified sampling and I'm gonna talk about uh, probability proportional to size sampling. So two uh, very important topics in sampling. Again, for those of you that are, um, where you know your statistical office is using the GSBPM, um, we're in design uh, stage still, so 2.4. So we're still designing the frame and sample at this point. And then we're also in 4.1, which is creating the frame and selecting the sample. So depending on how, where you take this presentation, you're worried that the design step or the actual implementation of it, but it's 2.4 and 4.1. All right, so stratified sampling, what is it? Stratification is uh, dividing our frame into homogeneous, mutually exclusive groups called strata. So strata being the, the plural and stratum being the singular. Um, stratification is just splitting things up into groups. And I've got this strong dislike for the term stratified sampling, because for me, um, if I ever become chief statistician of the world, which I'm not on a career path to do, but I always like to daydream, if I were to have this opportunity, I, I would never let these two words be used together because Stratification to me is dividing your sample, your frame up into these groups, which is exactly what we're doing. But then once we do that, we sample from within each of our strata if we want that. To me, when we talk about stratified, when we talk about this, it, it becomes confusing because it, it, people think what they were selecting strata amongst our sample, but that's not what we're doing. We're just dividing our population up. And we're gonna see a bunch of examples of this. So um, we're gonna sort of unbox this or untangle this over the next few slides. And then we want to select an independent sample from each of these strata. And once we can do this, we can use any sample selection method we want once we're inside a strata. The nice thing about stratification is because they're mutually exclusive groups, we can do any sampling method we want in each of these strata, and they don't have to be the same. We just have to keep track of it in, um, in our records to know how we did it. And then when we recombine all the data, if we're planning on doing that, we, then we need to know, okay, what method was used? How can we join this data together? So uh, I find that sort of really enjoyable about stratified sampling. So here's an example where they stratified by both age and sex. So they have these, uh, they've made three age groups, 18 to 34, and then 35 to 64 and 65 plus. And then they've split it between male and female. And they've just sort of done this random sample in each of these categories or each of these strata, I should call them. And this is how it looks. So now they can do analysis by age and sex and they're guaranteed to have a certain sample in each of these groups. I'm gonna go back to my farm example here, so the six farms. So I talked about this in week, last week, and I said, there's a little bit of a problem here. And the problem is, is that we've got, we've got a mix of sort of at least two different types of farms, sort of just eyeballing this data. We can see that there are small farms, and now I've added this column acres, which is sort of adding to the, the idea that some are big and some are small. And so we've got these small farms, we've got big farms. And 
there are one population, there are six units, but maybe we should stratify and keep these two groups separately. And that's what we're gonna look at now. So perhaps we wanna divide this into small and large groups. So um, with stratum one, we can look at small farms. So under 300 acres and for large farms could be 300 acres or more. And we start to see that this looks kind of nicer, right? So the small farms, uh, their maximum expenditure is 63,800. And then for the larger farms, their, their minimum expenditure is 145,000. So we split this up into two groups so that we can now say amongst the small farms in our population, we have this. And amongst our large farms of population, we have this. Whereas before we couldn't do that, when we kept them all together, we may not have been able to analyze it like that. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go forward. So uh, here we see if we take two farms from each of our stratum, so we say we're, we're gonna guarantee that we take two large farms, we're gonna guarantee that we take two small farms. When we look at the overall mean farm expenditures, we get these values. And to compare with what we had last week, so last week we just did a simple random sample where we said, let's select four farms and we can pick any four farms. And what this does is, is it eliminates accidentally taking the three smallest or the three largest farms because you'll see that in the first, we lose some of our bigger ones. So um, we have some in the 200,000 range when we take three big farms and one small farm. And we have some in a much lower range, like 61,000, 83,000 in the middle there, when we take three of our small farms and one big farm. So by splitting them out and saying there's, there's two populations happening inside of our data, um, it's sort of, it's gonna uh, help us to do analysis. So what are the advantages here? There's a few. So I, I have to write can, right? Really what I wanna say is it will, but I always have to sort of protect myself by saying it's only can, but this will increase the precision of your overall estimates of population. As soon as you have these characteristics that you can divide on, uh, things are gonna go better for you. It can be operationally or administratively more convenient. Um, again, I would really like prefer to write will, but you can devise scenarios where it, it doesn't, but they're really hard to do. The disadvantages here, so your stratification variable must be available for all the units on the frame. If we stratify, for example, in that earlier example where we have male and female and age, if we don't know someone's sex or we don't know someone's age, um, we have to leave them out of our sample because we can't have, we don't have a subpopulation where one of those two variables is unknown. It's gonna require a restructuring of the frame prior to sampling. And stratification might not be good for all variables of interest. So, you know, when I stratify on large farm and small farm, that's interesting. If I stratify on farm types, such as, you know, root vegetables or animals, this is gonna be interesting, but there may be some ways that you can stratify farms where it's not gonna, it's not gonna work well for, um, it's not gonna work well for the, the, the analysis you're doing, such as you could stratify on the last name of the farm owner. And there should, you know, you'd have this weird thing if there's an effect between farms owned by people whose last names are from A to L and then M to Z. So, um, you know, it might not, you've got to be careful when you do the stratification. Um, yeah, let's move on. There was something I wanted to speak about earlier, but I think it comes up again later. So there's going to be some factors there that influence the efficiency of what we do. So, what we end up doing is by stratifying, we end up doing independent surveys. And we're, I'm going to show this in a second in a Canadian example that hopefully uh, we'll all be able to follow. But this choice of stratification variable, if we end up with a, a large number of strata, it's going to become cumbersome to do the work and it's going to become uh, potentially inefficient. But we'll see that. Uh, determination of stratum limits, good. That's what I want to go back to and talk about. And I'll show that in. Um, second, and also the allocation of sample to strata, whether we do it in a proportionate manner or disproportionate manner. So one of the things I talked about back here was this idea of large and small farms. But if I said, what is a large farm? What is a small farm? You could have said that small farms were 125 acres or less and small and large farms are 126 acres and more. And this would give us exactly the same result for this population. That definition doesn't change a thing. However, we talked about this two weeks ago, where when we start doing these conceptual definitions, we have to be concerned about comparability elsewhere. So this may be six farms in the city that I live in, whereas if I want to compare it to another city, another province, another country, it becomes much more important to say, what is this definition going to be? And 
uh, for us, we would get, so Statistics Canada, we would get this from uh, Agriculture Canada. So there's another government ministry in Canada that deals with uh, farming and agriculture. We would go to them and say, in fact, this survey would invariably be for them anyways. We'd say, you know, what are these definitions of small and large farms that are used? And they may go to international standards as well and ask someone at the UN uh, Food Agency or something and say, you know, how should we be defining our farms in order to produce results that are comparable internationally? So the determination of these limits can be very important. Uh, in fact, I put the same slide here so I didn't have to go back. Now, strata. So 2017 labor force survey in Canada. So we did a survey redesign. This is how many strata we ended up with. So when we think of stratification by age and sex, um, those are sort of small potatoes compared to the rest here. So we had something called regular strata where we had 930 of them across the country. Um, we had Aboriginal strata, which is where we have high incidence of indigenous populations. This can become very important for us for some of the surveys we do. Uh, we also recognize high income strata. So sometimes we wanna do surveys that uh, are income related and sometimes we, we wanna target high income neighborhoods. We also had 55 strata that were related uh, to high immigration. We had large cluster. We also had this thing called one stage. So a one stage cluster, uh, sorry, a one stage strata for us has to do with where the population is so sparse um, that we would treat, there would be no sub uh, strata below it, which I'm not sure if I talk about later. It's more of a technicality of the survey. So there's a lot of different strata here. So there was 1,153 uh, different definitions. Now, so once we've done this, once we've decided that we're going to stratify, we then have to say, okay, we've selected a sample, we're going to select a sample. We have a certain amount of um, interviews allocated to us. We have to then divide that by the strata. We have to decide in stratum one, if we go back to that concept of male, female, and three age groups, we might define stratum one as being, um, you know, males 18 to 34. And then we had males uh, 35 to 64, males 65 plus, and then same thing for females. We would have to say ahead of time, if we're using the stratification method, we'd have to say ahead of time what sample we're gonna select from each of these groups. And so we can allocate this as I, you see on the slide here, we can do this proportional, which can be allocated to N proportional, which is the size of the population. This is a very common method. Um, it's just to done proportionally to the number of units in each stratum. Or we can do some sort of disproportionate allocation, which effectively is anything that isn't proportional allocation. As soon as you make it not proportional, it becomes disproportional. All right, situations where we're going to use disproportional allocation. So there's three big ones here. So, um, well, there's four. One is that we might need the estimates at the stratum level. So we have to guarantee that smaller strata are oversampled. And this is one of, I would say, this is one of the most important reasons to use stratified sampling because you may have a, a region, for example, I'm gonna show an example in Canada. You may have a region that if you did random sampling across your whole country and you had some sort of geographical um, delineation, geopolitical delineation. So um, uh, for us, it's provinces. In some countries it might be, I'm not sure what other kind of delineations there are. I should, I have one in my head, but it's escaping me. Um, but if we had to do analysis at these levels, um, then we, we'd have some uh, reason to be concerned if we had really small ones. Um, parishes, that's the word I was looking for. I think some countries divide their, their um, geopolitical boundaries into parishes. All right, so another one's gonna be non-response. I'm gonna give example, in fact, I'm gonna give examples of all of these on slides coming up. So let's just go ahead and look at this. So, Suppose that we calculate the number of respondents. So the number of completed surveys we need for a stratum is a thousand. And so for each of our stratum, for our survey, if we split it up into six or 12 or whatever, we know that we need to have a thousand completed questionnaires for each of those stratum to be able to do analysis. So again, if we wanna look back at the male, female and the six splits or the three splits per sex for uh, six splits, we might say that we need a thousand responses in each of these to be able to do the analysis. So historically in the stratum A, we have a response rate of 80%. And in this other stratum, we have 50%. So you'll notice I say historically, without historical knowledge of what the non-response is gonna be like, it's very difficult to do allocation by non-response because you, you may not have an idea of what's driving this. It's Statistics Canada, geography is a big one that we use for this. 
but we also might use something like the sensitivity of the survey being asked. So if we have uh, surveys that have very sensitive questions, we know the response rate is going to go down and we can adjust the, our, our rates based on that, our anticipated rates. So if we have an 80% response rate in stratum A, um, that means we would have to have a sample size, a, mi a minimum of 1,250, because if we take 80% of 1,250, that gets us back down to 1,000. And for stratum B, which has a response rate of 50%, we'd have to boost the sample up to 2,000 to, to guarantee that we're going to get 1,000 responses. So this might not be true, but we hope it is. Um, this is unfortunately horrible for the interviewers, because what you're saying is, the more difficult the region or the more diff difficult the subpopulation is to agree to interviews, the more people are going to have to try with. And this can introduce bias, but um, we're not really going to get into that in this presentation. But this is how we adjust by non-response. So we just we boost our sample size based on its spin and non-response, but we can do it by stratum. Uh, allocation affected by variability. I talked about this, I think, very briefly in the first presentation. So imagine we're doing a survey where we're trying to estimate household net worth. So we need to find out what their income is. We need to find out what their holdings are. And for a low income neighborhood, you're going to get a very stable estimate with because everyone in a poor neighborhood will have relatively the same income, relatively the same net worth. There's going to be some outliers, usually on the upper end, um, but it's it's, it's gonna be stable. Whereas in a high income neighborhood, you can have people living beside each other that are worth you know, four to 10, whatever times more than each other. And it's not an insignificant amount of money. It's a, there's, there's gonna be huge amounts of money uh, in difference in these populations. So you may have to oversample in your rich neighborhoods to get an idea of what the, the estimated household net worth is. And <clears throat> excuse me, it's very easy to come up with examples where you'd almost have to do a census where missing one person in your population, um, you know, Jeff Bezos or, or uh, Bill Gates, if you miss them in a neighborhood, it, it's going to totally change the overall net worth. So a large variability in answers means that you have to sample more people. Um, I got tripped up, my entire class got tripped up in a university course where the question was, the problem is, is the, the premise seems um ridiculous but you know that everyone in a certain community makes exactly the same amount of money and then the question is how many people do you have to interview to find out what the average income is in that community and the answer is one because everyone makes the same amount and none of us in university could figure this out because the idea that you know that everyone has the same income doesn't make sense but in certain situations it does so for example at statistics in the federal government in canada um everyone has a, a two digit, uh, I think it's only a two digit, a two letter code, and then a two digit code to say what, what job they have and what level. And within that, there's certain levels, but you can certainly know right away by sampling one person what the pay scale is for that letter code and, and uh, number, because they all make the same amount. So that, that's a good example of that one, I guess. Now I'm going to go back to my Saskatchewan example from last time. So this is one where cost is going to be an issue. And this is, you know, in sampling costs is something that we have to take into consideration. We have to take into consideration this for face-to-face -face interviews. And certainly when I uh, started as Statistics Canada in the 1900s, we had to take into account things like long distance charges, which just don't apply to us anymore. Um, it's just not the same, it's not the same ball of wax that it used to be. Anyways, suppose that we're doing a survey and we have that in this case, we're doing Saskatchewan, this province in Canada. And we have to do 2,000 face-to-face interviews. Uh, the two major cities in this province are Regina and Saskatoon. And we're going to conduct 1,000 interviews there. And we're going to conduct 1,000 interviews in the, in the more rural areas. And if you think about doing face-to-face -face interviews, the cost for doing interviews in a rural area uh, is much higher because it requires much more travel time to, to go meet these people. These numbers are 100% fictitious. I just made this stuff up to make my life easy to do the math. I, I literally have no idea how much an interview costs or how much we budget for an interview. Um, this isn't to pay the respondent, obviously. This is for uh, interviewer time and all the other management that goes into it. But these are, are completely fictitious numbers. So suppose that the cost of an interview in the city is, is $50 and it's $100 out, elsewhere. And the cost, the overall cost of collection is $150,000. 
we can see right away that the cost of doing an interview in a rural area is two interviews in the city. So right, right away, we can start to think if we can optimize, if we can somehow reduce the number of interviews we're doing in uh, the countryside, we can sort of do more interviews in the city if that's required. So that's exactly what we're going to look at. So suppose we do some analysis, we look at previous results, we look at um, the anticipated outputs, what it is that we're trying to measure. Um, I do have a question, but I'm just going to finish this thought and then I'll get to it. So um, suppose that we, we do all our analysis, we figured out with 500 responses, we should get an accurate enough uh, answer for what we're looking for. So we can do two things here. We can see that we can reduce our costs. We can either just cancel 500 surveys uh, done in the more rural areas, which will save us 50,000, or we can translate this into doing more interviews in the city. So uh, if we do a thousand, by canceling 500 interviews in the rural area, we can now do a thousand interviews in the, a thousand more interviews in the city, which gives us a total count of 2,500 interviews as opposed to just 2,000 here. So we've gained an extra 500 interviews by putting more emphasis on interviews in the city. And depending on what you're measuring, it may be more important to measure in the city. Uh, it may be more important to measure in the rural area. And this is something you do have to keep taking into consideration. All right, so the question I have here is, what is the best type of sampling to use when you have uh, free enough phone numbers? Can stratification take place if the area community is also known uh, for each contact? So yeah, uh, this one, it really depends on the country you live in um, or the kind of geography that you have. So for example, if there's a way to stratify into uh, some sort of geographical split that you have in that country, then by all means, you'd wanna do that. You'd wanna stratify into, for us, it's provinces. We would immediately stratify our collection into provinces, even if we're doing it by telephone number. So um, if you have, if there's auxiliary information that comes with your phone numbers, then for sure you, you, could, you could use that if it was some advantage to you. And then I think I have another, hold on, I'm just gonna scroll down. Uh, no, that was it. So that was the only question. All right, uh, hopefully I answered that. If not, you feel free to ask another. Okay, so some of these disproportional allocation methods. So we can do square root of n. I'm gonna show an example of this in the next uh, slide. Uh, we do wide proportional allocation. So it's possible that the example I like to use in Canada is farms. So we may know the number of farms in each province, and we may know the overall annual output for each farm. And it may be that in certain regions, the farms are much bigger. So we may have the same number of farms in two provinces, whereas one has a much bigger production output, and that may be more important to us. So we could say, instead of allocating based on um, the number of farms, we could allocate based on the, the expected outco outputs uh, based on previous years. So there you're doing a wide proportional allocation. So basing it on uh, whatever it is that you're measuring. Um, the statistician Naaman, he got in when the getting was good, and he looks at assigning more uh, based on uh, sampling units to larger strata and or strata with higher variances. So those things that we talked about um, earlier, he got in early, put his name on this one, and it's fairly straightforward. And then there's this thing called optimum allocation. This one takes into account cost which is exactly what we looked at at the previous slide. All right, um, here is, so here's an example from Canada. This is obviously gonna be more relevant uh, for Canadians, but these are our 10 provinces. So um, <clears throat> Newfoundland through to British Columbia, it basically in this picture travels from east at the top to west at the bottom. Now, what you'll notice right away is uh, Ontario and Quebec are massive provinces relative to some of the other ones. So, Prince Edward Island is a small island province with 142,000 people on it. Um, and Ontario has, uh, it, I'm certain now it's over 14 million. These numbers are slightly old. So they get together. Uh, we sometimes have uh, provincial representatives that come into Statistics Canada. Um, there's a certain level of separation between federal government and provincial governments, and they may need to look at this data. And so the provincial representatives come in and say, okay, let, let's carve up the sample. We've already decided the federal government's allocated 10,000 uh, interviews for this. They've got a budget for this. And they say, let's do this. So Ontario and Quebec stand up together and they say, this is a very important topic. Let's do this proportional to end. Let's, it's, it's important for the entire population. We're gonna do it by population. And so they high five each other and sit back down and they attempt to grab 
6,168 interviews out of 10,000. Prince Edward Island stands up and they say, can we stop playing this game? You play this all the time. Obviously, if I do, is, if I have sample allocation of 41 to my entire province, I'm not going to be able to get any kind of publishable result. We're not going to get any idea of how this works in our province. So this isn't going to work for us. Uh, there's a joke, not a particularly good joke at Statistics Canada, that if you live in Prince Edward Island, you're either a StatsCan interviewer or a StatsCan interviewee because we have to oversample this province so much all the time for every one of our surveys. Um, so PEI continues their standing upness. And they say, look, let's take the square root of our population. In reality, the square root of the population doesn't mean anything at all. The fact that the square root of PEI's population is 378 and the square root of Ontario's population is 3,667 means absolutely nothing. There's no real world meaning of this. What it does is, is it dampens down the extremes. So Ontario and Quebec are still much larger numbers, but it, there's this dampening effect. So it reduces the effect of these outliers. And if we look at the very last column, if we do the square root of n proportional allocation, Ontario and Quebec still get uh, 4,100 interviews, but now the sample allocated to, uh, to PEI is 239. So it spreads these interviews out more across the provinces, or in this case, like the strata. Um, so that's something you can do. Again, this is strictly mathematical. There's no real world interpretation of what the square root of your population means. Now, they might um, congratulate themselves. They've come to this finding. They all sort of leave to go back to their provinces. This piece of paper gets shuffled over to uh, the methodologists that then now need to sit down and do the calculations. And they look at this and they say, you know, oh my goodness, this isn't going to work at all. And by doing square root of n proportional allocation, the only thing they've taken into account is these population sizes. And they haven't taken into account anything else. They haven't looked at cost. They haven't looked at variability of answers. They haven't looked at anything. So it could be that the methodologist sits down and says, all right, we need to allocate 250 to um, PE at, at a minimum to any province. And so we're missing 11 interviews for PEI. The simple way to do this is you either boost the budget up to 10,011, or you steal 11 interviews from the other provinces when they aren't looking, or something like that. So there's ways to fix that. On the business side, um, we're going to see this a little bit in the PPS, but I'm going to talk about it on the stratification side. Based on the size of business, we have these things called take all stratification. So for us, for large businesses, we do a census. Um, to be sort of global with the idea, if we have um, companies that are that are making soda pop, uh, soda pop producers, Coca Cola and Pepsi should never ever be excluded from our surveys. A one percent change in Canadian sales of Pepsi or Coke is uh, phenomenally large. If we have a regional bottling, uh, I live in Ottawa. Let's say there's the Ottawa Pop Shop. You know, a a, a one thousand percent change in their sales was a, is a drop in the bucket literally of what Coke and Pepsi produce. So we have to take our larger companies and then for each of these strata, we can treat them differently. So for smaller, um, for slightly smaller companies, we might do this SRS, simple random sample, which we talked about last week. For smaller companies still, we might do systematic. <clears throat> and in a lot of cases, this slide actually, most of the businesses fit in something we call the take none, which isn't on the slide. The take none are companies that are so small, they'll have no effect on the estimates or such little effect on the estimate that we'll just use the administrative data we have from the year before, so we're not interrupting them. So that's just a slide I like to show here. All right, so we're going to quickly do a systematic stratified sample. So I'm going to draw a sample of 10 farms, and the stratification is by farm type. We need to figure out how much for each stratum. We're going to see this when I do it. And we're going to do, uh, if we remember our systematic sampling from last time, it's a systematic stratified sample. The random start for stratum one is going to be three, and the random start for stratum two is going to be six. And we're going to calculate the mean expenditure in each stratum. So let's just quickly do this. Stratum one, we can see in the slide, stratum one is 34 cattle farms, and stratum two is 32 corn or other farms. I have a total of 100 interviews that I can do, so I have to figure it out. If I was going to do this strictly by farm, which I think is the way I do it, I have 34 farms in my first stratum. I have 66 farms in my second stratum. So I allocate 34% of my uh, sample of 10. 
uh, to the first one, which is 3.4, and I rounded down to three. And in the second one, I have six. I have 66% of my population, um, which gives me uh, 6.6 .6 interviews or seven. So I do seven interviews in my second stratum and three in the first one. So my K here is dependent on which stratum I'm in. So my population in the first stratum is 34 and I'm doing three interviews. So I'm skipping through every 11.3. And in the second one, I have 66 farms. I'm selecting seven of them to do interviews. I'll skip through every 9.4th farm. And again, I have my random starts. So in the first one, I'll select farm three, 14, and 25. And in the second one, I select, because uh, my random start is six, I go six, I add 9.4, I get to 15, 24, 34, 43, 53, 62. From here, I can calculate the averages and uh, fairly easy to do. I get that my mean uh, expenditure in the cattle farms is 30,000 and the mean expenditure in the others 10,057. So this is, I've stratified these two populations. I've allocated sample based on that. And then I do these two completely independent samples uh, calculation, the two completely different calculations to get their totals. And then I use other statistical methods to find the uh, weighted average between the two, which I'm not gonna do in this presentation. Or I am, sorry, I am going to do that. <laughs> um, by doing the weighted one, I say that each farm in the first stratum has an average of 30,000, so I multiply that out. In the second one, I multiply by 10,000, and I find that the overall average farm expenditure is 16,837. All right, moving on to the second part. I only have 18 minutes left, but this was always, this was meant to be a smaller part anyways. So probability proportional to size sampling is a technique that uses auxiliary information to, to, to sample now. So I have a little bit more information. I talked about this briefly on the slide about uh, Pepsi and Coke, where I want bigger companies to have a bigger chance of being selected. The way I dealt with it earlier was I stratified. I said, let's stratify into big, medium, and small. Now I'm just gonna say, you know what? I'm gonna let this pr probability proportional to size do it for me. So here the probability of being selected is unequal. It's based on your size. It's proportional to the size. Now, when do we want to use this or when can we use this? We use this when there's a size measure available and there's a strong correlation between the size measure of the unit and the character, characteristics of interest. There's a very, um, on the analysis side, this is mostly just used for business surveys. On the administrative side, it's used in household surveys, but I'm going to show that as an example later on. Okay, so what PPS does is it just shifts from count to size. So originally we had our six farms, and now we're gonna move from our six farms to the acres. So I'm gonna say the probability to be selected is based on the size of your farm. We see in the example I have here that, um, I think, well, I don't do the total, but the total number of acres is 2000. So farm number two has half of the acres. Whereas in, we just look at the count of farms, it represents one sixth of the farms. So its size is much different than it's just, it's relative, you know, it's relative size that it should be. You can use any sort of sampling technique we've used already using PPS. Again, we literally just shift from the count over to the acres to do this. If we wanna do, so what we do is, um, the example I use in Canada, I don't know if you have this in your country, but we have these things called 50-50 draws. It's like a, it's a raffle effectively. You can buy as many raffle tickets as you want. You can buy as many lottery tickets as you want. The fact that you've bought a lottery ticket doesn't mean you have the same chance as everyone else who's bought lottery tickets. Because if I buy one lottery ticket and Tracy buys three lottery tickets, Tracy should have three times the chance of winning that I do, which is exactly how this works. I tell students to think of, think of us drawing tickets out of a hat. So before, originally we're drawing names out of a hat. So the names of the farms are one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we're gonna draw an acre out of the hat. So I'm gonna say acre number, whatever is selected and we see which farm that comes from. I'm going to show you how this is done. So we need to add this new column, which you'll see here. Column number four is called range. So the first farm gets ticket number one through 50. The second farm gets ticket 51 through 1050. And we just continue this on until we have all 2,000 acres. If we want to do a simple random sample, we can just pick any number between one and 2,000, and that farm is chosen. But what we'll see is if we're just randomly selecting a number, then farm number two has a 50% chance of being selected because they hold 50% 50, 50 of the acres. Uh, for a much smaller farm, like farm number six, they have a 25 in, in 2,000 chance of being selected. It's very rare. You'd have to pick out a numbered ticket 
between 1976 and 2000 for farm number six to be selected. Um, in this example on the slide, we're doing, um, uh, yeah, we were just selecting one farm. Here we're doing a systematic, uh, so we have to calculate our K. So again, because we switched from six farms to 2,000 acres, our cumulative size is 2,000. And our sample size in this example is we're going to select two farms. So again, we, stick, we select a random start and then we go forward. So in this case, where we have two, our K, so our, our lowercase n is two, our, um, our uppercase n is 2,000. So it's 2,000 divided by two, which gives us 1,000. We pick some random start. In my example here, I have 725. It's the first one selected, which falls into farm number two, which isn't surprising. Then we skip forward by 1,000 and we get uh, ticket number 1725, which belongs to farm five. So these are our two farms that are selected. The advantages of this is it, it adds a lot of statistical efficiency. It means that our smaller, more important um, units will have a higher chance of being selected. They tend to be more important in our surveys. If we aren't able to stratify or we don't choose to stratify, this is a way to deal with that. <clears throat> The disadvantage here is that it we need even more information on our frame. So before the frame just had, the, had to have the contact information for six farms, now we have to have some measure of size as well. So this, it gets more and more complicated. The other thing that is gonna become more complicated is because we now have um, a disproportionate chance of being selected, we now have to include weights of probability of selection in when we're doing our estimates. So it's not the same as when everyone had an equal chance of being selected. All right, so here I'm gonna do a quick example. So I'm gonna draw, again, I'm gonna draw 10 farms. And this time I'm gonna do it proportional to the number of acres. So the last example I did, last week we did simple random sample and uh, systematic random sample. And it was all based on the farm number. What was the number of the farm and we'd skip through the farms. We did um, a stratified sample five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. And there we stratified it into these two different farm types. Now we're just going to look at size. Okay, so um, we're going to we have to so we're going to do a systematic again, but we're going to systematically jump through the acres, and hopefully this will make sense when you see it. So now I've got this. Um, I've got our farms. These are the same farms we used before. We have a measure of acre. We have our expenses, but now we also have this uh, cumulative acres. So the very first farm you see there has cumulative acres of one hundred. So it has. Farm, it has acre tickets number one to 100. The second farm will have ticket 101 to 150. So every farm just has the previous farm's cumulative acres plus one to the cumulative acres that it has. So uh, I'm just gonna pick one totally at random here. If I look at farm number 85, the acre tickets that it has is 26,896 to 27,045. So, that's how we do this. So I calculate my sampling interval, my K. There's 31,655 acres in my entire population. I'm going to divide this by 10 because I want to um, select 10 farms. So I'm going to skip every 3,165th acre through my sample until I've selected 10 farms. So I'm going to randomly start at 623. 623 is the sixth farm. So if we look at the sixth farm, it has uh, acre, cumulative acre number 551 to 680. So it's the first farm that I select. Oh, I didn't highlight them. I thought I'd highlight them. Oh, there, I highlight them at the end. So these are the 10 farms that I select. So I skip forward by 3,165.5 each time. And then I just find which one of the uh, farms has the, the, uh, the selected acre. And these are my farms that I've chosen. Each of these farms has a different, a different probability of inclusion, and so their weights are going to be totally different. I don't go through this in this presentation. I used to, but uh, when we did a review of the way the presentations were done, they said your weighting presentation is much later on. Don't include weighting in this presentation. Strictly talk about the way the sampling is done. But if we look at farm number 77 and we look at farm number 94, Farm number 94 is one-tenth the size of farm number 77. So if we were going to use it to do estimates, we would have to, they, one would have 10 times the weight of the other. So these are some of the things we got to take into consideration. Now, 
I don't, I can't remember if I said it, but uh, PPS sampling is one of my, oh, I did say this because we talked about uh, being unbiased in our selection of sampling methods and that we shouldn't choose favorites and that they're all our children. This is one of my favorites. I, I absolutely love PPS sampling. And I'm gonna explain to you why in a scenario here using the city of Ottawa. So analysts prefer to have weights as consistent as possible. When the weights vary a lot, it means that uh, individual observations can have bigger effects on the overall population. This is totally natural in the way that samples are collected and the way that estimations are done. But I, I believe it's better overall if they're all approximately the same, that everyone's um, giving you the same sort of effect. Our field operations people, they want this as simple as possible to manage, obviously. They don't, if when, we, when we drop really technical sampling methods on them, they won't see how the sample is selected, but they'll be the victims of having to go to collect the data. So for example, in when I talked in the first week about face-to-face -face interviews in Saskatchewan, and I said, I need 10 face-to-face -face interviews conducted in this large province, the field operations people would look at me and say, this is totally wrong, you can't do this. You need to use cluster sampling, which we'll see in the future. Um, this, this kind of uh, cluster, this PPS sampling is gonna work. It's cluster sampling, I'm gonna explain in a minute. So they want things as simple as possible for their interviewers. Effectively, they want all of their interviewers to have exactly the same caseload. They don't wanna send one interviewer out having to do 15 interviews, and another interviewer out having to do 75 interviews. They prefer if everyone has the same workload. I think we all do. The respondents, um, this is slightly a joke that I put in here. I assume it's probably gonna be the same all over. They're the taxpayers. They want an equal chance to have their voice heard. Everybody wants to do Statistics Canada surveys. Um, Tracy's laughing, everyone else is confused. You know, nobody really wants to, very few people want to do our surveys, but we still prefer if everyone has an equal chance of being selected. And truly they should, this should be the way they take it. They should say, we're the taxpayers, I want an equal chance of contributing uh, my, you know, my voice to these surveys everyone else. Now, what do methodologists want, which is what we are, methodologists just want everyone to be happy. So if we can use some sort of sampling method that keeps the analysts, field operations, and respondents all happy, then we've done our job or we've made our job easier. So PPS sampling can do this. Labor Force Survey in Canada collects 56,000 uh, house uh, data from 56,000 households a month. We split Canada into clusters. So first we, we saw earlier where I said there was something like uh, 1,900, 1,700 uh, different strata. Within the strata, we do clustering. So within the city of Ottawa, which I'm gonna show you, within each of our clusters, we fix a certain number of interviews. And last time I checked, it was six. So in each cluster, we do six interviews. One interviewer will have many clusters that they have to go to. They don't just have six, but um, there's six interviews per cluster to, to get the math to work out right. This is a really poorly uh, drawn boundary map of the city of Ottawa. And then we do clustering. So there's four, nine, there's 10 clusters, I think. Imagine if the entire city was partitioned into these little clusters. And what Statistics Canada aims for, we cluster the entire country. And we wanna have approximately, I think 250 to 300 households in each of these small little clusters. But these things change over time. And what can happen is, is we may have a cluster with 500 households in one. And then we have another one that just had some recent um, growth. So they put in some apartment complexes or just a lot of houses. And now there's a thousand uh, occupied dwellings in this other area. So we have this uh, problem where one of them is twice as big as the other. If we do six interviews in each, so if we sample six from the 500 in the first one, everyone has a six in 500 chance of being selected or 1.2%. But in the poor cluster B, where there's a thousand households, the chance of being selected here is only 0.00, it's 0.6%. You're half as likely to be selected because of the fact that um, there's twice as many households to select from because the number of interviews is fixed. So taxpayer gets upset for cluster B. I only have half the chance of being selected. I only have half the chance of um, sharing my information. Whereas the cluster A are like, oh man, this is amazing. We have twice the chance of our poor neighbors of being selected for these interviews. Stats game people are gonna come and we're gonna be able to share all of our information with them. So how do we fix this? We go up a level. And what we do is we, we make this proportional to size. 
if we have, obviously we have to have on our file the fact that these sizes have changed and we now have 500 dwellings in one and a thousand in the other. If we step up a level and say, the chance of a cluster being selected is based on its size, we then have that the one with a thousand people, a thousand, sorry, a thousand dwellings in it is twice as likely as being selected. So if we multiply this across that the cluster selection had twice the chance of being selected, but then inside the cluster, you have half the chance of being selected. This works out that the chance of anyone being selected in cluster uh, A and anyone being selected in cluster B is exactly the same. They have the same chance of being selected. And they're each gonna have the same design weight, which we'll talk about in a future presentation. So I sort of, um, that one was a little quick at the end, but that's how PPS sampling works. It just has to do with choosing things proportional to the size that they are, whether it be the number of acres on a farm, the number of households in a community, whatever statistic you have or whatever information you have on your frame, you can then use this to proportionally uh, sample proportionally uh, to size. 